right. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thank you for, to, for coming to the Black Side of the Moon Part 2. It's not an electric boogaloo, but it might be an Empire Striking Back. <laughs> Talking about comics and superheroes with an illustrious and praiseworthy panel full of truly talented people. We're going to introduce them, them to you real quickly. And I'm going to just dive into our slideshow here because I like PowerPoints because they give me a sense of control. All right, uh, let me go here. All right, so uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to have some basic introduction of who our panelists are. Um, we're going to uh, go into a section I call Black to the Future, looking at what we were able to see at some point, the cards that were dealt, and then how we go deeper than this, and finally opening up for questions and answers. Uh, so I always have to show off all the slides and go slowly because, well, I put the little moon up in the corner. I thought I was very clever because, you know, these sorts of things amuse me because I'm a maniac. All right. First, the first panelist that we have is the very, very talented Dr. Jalandra Davis, who I, I well, we, we, we've known each other for a lot of years outside of her academic stance, but uh, Dr. Davis, could you please introduce yourself, uh, tell the people a little bit about your background, uh, what your current work is like, and where people can find you and your work, possibly online or in other ways. Hello, um, I am a writer. My name is Dr. Jalandra A. Davis. I am a writer and scholar. And my, <laughs> my background, well, my research looks at um, primary, I look at Afrofuturism, but I'm primarily interested in narratives around gender and sexuality in Black women's science fiction, um, as well as larger narratives of um, gender, of race, gender, sexuality in popular culture. Um, I am a UC Presidential Postdoctoral Fellow at UC San Diego. I'm a former lecturer at Cal State LA. And I graduated from UC Riverside with a PhD in ethnic studies and a, a concentration in science fiction and techno cultures. Um, I do write creatively, but my creative work is realist. <laughs> um, but you can find my book and you can find also some of my scholarly articles at my website, www.jalandraadavis.com. And right now my project, I am working on Black Mermaids. All right, I will ask you some more about that in a little bit. Uh, our second panelist, uh, the, the uh, uh, well, we, we've also had a, a relationship for some time where we've been uh, trying to help each other uh, uh, under, under, the, under the table, uh, get a lot of things done. <laughs> Mr. Robert K. Jeffrey, could you uh, talk about who you are, what your current work is like, and where people can find you and your work online? Yeah, uh, my name is uh, Robert Jeffrey II. I'm a graduate of the uh, 2017 DC Comics Writers Workshop and a writer or co-writer of such series as Route 3, uh, Changa and the Jade Obelisk, uh, shout out to Milton, <laughs> Redcon, uh, Mind to Avenge, The Crossing, and uh, Radio Free America. And uh, my DC Comics works uh, work features uh, John Stewart, the greatest Green Lantern ever known. Uh, I work for such clients as, as mentioned, DC Comics, uh, the Centers for Disease Control, and also Sun of Oak uh, Tabletop Gaming. And I'm currently the uh, editor in chief for BlackSciFi.com. So, a uh, freelance writer of all trades, jack of all trades, and. Uh, you can find all of my work at Robert K J E F F R E Y dot com. That's Robert K Jeffrey dot com. And I also do prose fiction, um, the Dark Universe, also with uh, Milton Davis. So, um, you know, I get in where I can fit in, basically. You made me very nervous when you started spelling. I was like, oh crap, did I spell his name wrong. But okay. no, no, you're good. You're good. I was so happy when I saw this. It was just like my name was right. <laughs> And last, but absolutely not least, Milton Davis, publisher, bon vivant, entrepreneur. Please tell people about who you are, what your current work is like, and where they can find you and your work online, especially, if I remember correctly, a little project that's going to be coming out pretty soon. Yeah, yeah. My name is uh, Milton Davis. I'm an author slash publisher. I write science fiction and fantasy based on African, African diaspora, history, traditions, and culture. Um, I am a, uh, my secret identity is a technical director for a small chemical company here in Atlanta, Georgia. And um, I'm kind of all over the place. Um, you uh, I've published about 21 novels since uh, beginning in 2008. I've got about nine anthologies out. Um, currently, I say my projects right now, I'm part of the Black Panther Tales of Wakanda um, authors in that anthology. 
I also have an anthology called Cyberfunk, which is going to be, um, which has just already out. Um, so you can take a look at that. Um, you can find me at www.mvmediaatl.com. And uh, that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> All right, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we're going to go right into the meat of our matter here. Uh, talking about uh, for decades, there were not many places that Black people could be found in the future. We had Uhuru, we had Tyrock. As time went on, we got some more images like Guinan and, and uh, Morphe stops shown here. But uh, there were scant glances at Black faces in a future that forgot us. So I'd like to turn to the panelists, starting with Dr. Davis, and uh, ask you to please talk about your experience in looking forward to possible futures and how, and how you were affected finding so few faces that looked like you. Mm -hmm. Um, well, for me, I think growing up, there were a couple of, um, like I watched a couple of the Star Trek shows um, and I was interested in science fiction and in futurism, but I had a lot, I actually growing up, a lot of my interest was more so in historical fantasy. And that's where, like as a young girl who was into I was into fairy tales, I was into princesses, I was into Disney, right? So those are the things that I was looking at where I wasn't seeing myself. Um, and I think that's actually what started my journey as a writer. When I was in about uh, middle school, I actually started doing these re re rewritings of all of the major fairy tales I enjoyed, putting black girls at the center of them. Um, and that's actually what started my journey as a writer. Like if I don't see something, I can actually make it myself. Um, in terms of the future, I do remember, one thing I remember really well is watching this movie Gattaca. It was this Ethan Hawke movie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, you know, it's just, and for some reason, I like really liked Ethan Hawke growing up, but <laughs> for, I remember it was, I, I know it's just, I, I, I just did. But um, we're not judging you. We're not. We're yeah. not judging you. <laughs> I remember watching all his movies, but there was this, um, you know, they were genetic engineered to be perfect people. And like all mm -hmm. the people were just, they were so white. Like it wasn't even just white. It was just like, so like blue, blue eyes, blonde hair. And that was kind of the point of the movie because Ethan Hawke was like the oppressed <laughs> non-genetically engineered figure in the film who was fighting against his oppression but I mean there were no black people so it was always that example when I started teaching science fiction and fantasy with my students that's the example that I always remember like coming back to I also remember that I did like the Star Trek shows and Star Trek Voyager was one of my favorite shows and even though there were black there were people with brown skin in the shows, like you had Lieutenant Tuvok or whatever, there was no culture except for kind of a very generic, I remember when they used to have their little cocktail parties on the ship. And stuff. <laughs> it will yes. always be this tinkling little piano music in the background, they'd be drinking champagne, like there was no, it was like no culture, even though they had the physical bodies of people from different you know, ethnicities, no other kind of culture seemed to have made it into the future. And, and mm. human culture was a monoculture, which was a white imperial westernized, very generic, <laughs> bland, seasonless, like it was just very, you know, cold and very sterile. Um, so I remember that, you know, really influencing kind of my, um, a little bit of a distaste for science fiction, actually. I was really interested in speculation and fantasy. Um, the fantasy shows I was watching, like Xena and, you know, things like that, they would have, like, actually a lot more people of color, you know, in those shows. And so I think that it, 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 it affected the way that I thought about science fiction. And, and I suppose it did. I, I don't know if that would have been a natural interest for me anyway in terms of thinking about far futures, which I could talk about later, but I think Please. it did affect my ability to see Black people located in those kinds of spaces. Okay. Uh, I'm really glad you talked about monoculture. I definitely want to dig into that a little more. Uh, Robert, same question. Please talk about your experience in looking forward and finding so few faces that looked like you. Yeah. So, you know, I, I come from the background of, I just love to read <laughs> you know, as, a, as a kid. So my mom was always, you know, taking my brother and, my, you know, and myself to the library to pick up whatever books we could read. And by extension of that, we started reading comic books. 
um, you know, my mom would pick them up from these places called drugstores. Um, <laughs> you just, you know, look them up. But that's where I started to see a lack of representation or at least as much representation I wanted to see in these like futuristic kind of far-flung stories. So, you know, for me, uh, Chris Claremont, Jim Lee's X-Men number one um, was huge. <laughs> it was huge. But uh, outside of Bishop and Storm, that was about it. <laughs> you know, I, and, I, and I love the fact that X-Men has always been multicultural uh, in its cast and, and then also, you know, with the, with the theme of the stories that it's telling. But uh, between that and other Marvel books that I read, it just seemed like there were less of me, you know, unless it was a group shot of New York City. Um, and around that time, I got really huge into Star Trek, as you can see on the blueprint uh, picture mm -hmm. behind me, with <laughs> Starship Enterprise. And the next generation was definitely, I'm an 80s baby, so the Star Trek that I grew up with were was like the back half of the next generation and then D Space Nine. So when I got D Space Nine, I was good to go <laughs> because I had Benjamin Sisko. I had him going, you know, wearing the 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 African style cloth, you know, or the clothes, or also just cooking Louisiana food, you know, just like and there was that sense of, and then also there are, there are episodes which focus on the Black experience in that show. So that's the Star Trek that I kind of grew up with, even though it definitely was like more bland and sterile, you know, if it wasn't D Space Nine. Um, and I definitely understand what you mean about Voyager, because I would be looking around at that crew and say, oh man, where are the Black people? You know, just to see if they were there. Um, so even though we were, we existed, it seemed like D Space Nine was the only one was the only Star Trek franchise at that point that allowed us to kind of experience our blackness, you know, in more ways than one. Uh, so I, I'm always happy that that was, the, that was the Star Trek that I was allowed, that I, not allowed, but that I kind of grew up with when it came to the future. And the only other example outside of that, it's, um, it kind of came out around the same time as Gattaca, is The Matrix, you know, two years later. For me, The Matrix, along with Milestone Comics, was a game changer for me because Milestone, there were people who looked like me creating the books and behind the scenes, I um, mean, you know, on the paper, on the pages of the comics and then behind the scenes. And then with the Matrix, I saw more black and brown and just other, you know, just other folks, you know, on this like sci fi space, you know, just the sci fi epic. And it blew my mind. You know, it, it blew my mind. And to this day, I wish Will Smith had accepted the role because that would have been, you know, just something that I, I could have loved to have seen. But that is, those are kind of this, kind of the big examples for me, Milestone, D Space, D Space Nine, and the first Matrix. I'm not going to say too much about this, the last few Matrix, Matrix movies, <laughs> but um, even though I love the second one, but yeah, those are, those are kind of my three examples for looking forward to, you know, the future. Okay. Uh, Milton, let's talk about, uh, let's talk about your perspective looking forward and what you felt like when you saw that the faces didn't always reflect your own. Well, I'm, I'm probably the old man of the group. I grew up in the 60s. And um, so, um, you know, um, and I grew up in the South. And uh, we were kind of, I don't, I don't wanna say conditioned, but I was kind of used to being in situations where I didn't see black people represented um, because of where we came from. But at the same time, I'm more influenced by my um, family. And in my family, we had a lot of entrepreneurs and, and, and also in the neighborhood that we lived in was a very mixed neighborhood where we had you know, middle-class black folks, but at the same time, uh, the first black surgeon in Columbus, Georgia, lived down the street from us. Um, one of the most successful black families uh, in, in the city, they have a funeral home, lived across the street from us. So we always had that influence. So whenever I saw stuff like science fiction, like the first Star Trek and, and Battlestar Galactica and stuff like that, I noticed the absence of us, but I understood that absence was because we weren't controlling these narratives. We weren't the people making these shows and stuff. And I think that kind of what, what probably what led me eventually into being an independent publisher and to start my own publishing company was because I said, when, when the time comes, I can do this and I can change this. Um, it's never been, a, um, I've never had an um, issue about the fact that, you know, people would say, well, certain people aren't imagining us in the future because I always felt like that once we get in that position, we would be the ones imagining us into the future in the future. And, and that's been the whole um, process I've taken. Um, 
you know, like I said, if you notice it, even in the, I, I grew up, you know, reading the Isaac Asimov and, and um, Frank Herbert and people like that, you know, and these, these are what they call the, the classic science fiction authors, um, because I had actually a English instructor who introduced me into science fiction as a way to get me to write, because at the time I wasn't really into science fiction. And again, mm -hmm. you know, you're reading these books and you're learning from them and you see that that's there, but you know, I was like, well, it's not there because we're not the publishers, we're not the writers. And when that time comes, you know, uh, when we make that happen, it will happen. So um, it never worried me about not seeing myself in these situations because I knew, I felt like eventually it was gonna happen. And it was gonna happen because we were gonna make it happen. And that's, and I think that's what, that's the place that we are now as far as science fiction. Well, I love that you kind of used your psychic power to jump ahead to my next question. I was going to ask what you thought was the incident, a moment that activated your motion to make a blacker future. Was it as far back as Battlestar Galactica, the first one with Boomer is the, and, and uh, Colonel, I think it was Colonel Ty, uh, the nice little afros that they had, or was it further back when you said, I can make a difference there and I'll work my way backward through the panels that way? Well, well I saw, um, it's funny that you mentioned Battlestar Galactica, again, showing my age. I remember when Battlestar Galactica debuted. It was my freshman year in college, and it was a, it was a a, a a night at Fort Valley. They called they called it Dog and Crab Night. That was a night that the freshmen were supposed to be hazed and stuff. But instead of me being out there, I was in my room, locked in my room, watching the first episode of Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> that was that was my thing. And you know, again, you know, you saw like you said, you saw Colonel Ty there. And to me, that was natural. I'm like, okay, this is this is natural supposed to have. Because to me, when I look at the future, um, I don't. The, to me, the future is a world where all the things that we deal with now, as far as race relations and everything else, no longer exist. That has been handled some kind of way. And that so when I look at the future, I don't imagine the future of us being in the same dealing with the same stuff that we're dealing with now, two thousand years from now. I guess I'm an optimist or something like that. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the way I look at it. And, and I know things change in increments, but you know, they do change. And so, you know, like I said, seeing the gradual change and, and feeling personally that it was going to happen. Um, that's kind of the way, um, I know I keep going back to my, how I was raised, but that's the way I was raised is that, you know, this is not right for you right now, but what you're doing is you're making a way so that not, you may not necessarily see the change but the generations coming after you will. So you do as much as you can to push it forward. And then hopefully the people coming behind you, coming after you will be able to push it to the next level. So um, again, that's that was my whole premise. And when I got into this as an author and as a publisher, um, in the back of my mind, I kind of had that same attitude that whatever I'm doing as an author, um, as far as publishing my own stories with black main characters, um, publishing anthologies that um, that emphasize that is hopefully laying that groundwork and helping that for that next author or that next publish publisher coming along to be even further ahead than where I am. And so that's where my energy comes from. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, I'm going to go to Robert now. When you found a way to work in a way to expand the representation that you didn't see, what would you say was the incident or moment that kind of activated your motion to make this Blacker future? It's the matrix. <laughs> yeah, I'm just, I keep coming back to that. I, so when, um, when that movie came out, I, I was, I think it was in my last year of high school and my cousin was visiting Atlanta. I'm a Atlanta trans, uh, Chicago, Chicago to Atlanta transplant. So she came to visit. Uh, it was like, Hey, do you want to go see the movie? And I just remember all the trailers of uh, Keanu Reeves and like goth leather, you know, dodging bullets and and it just it didn't really kind of speak to me. I, I was a big sci-fi hit, but I didn't know if that was going to be what I wanted to see. So we went and checked it out, and this was before the days of being spoiled about everything on the internet. And the, I mean, the internet exists, but it wasn't so spoilerific. And the movie just kind of blew my mind. Um, in like more ways than one. I, I wasn't used to the Hong Kong you know, style of filmmaking. I wasn't used to bullet time. I wasn't used to seeing, you know, Florence Fishburne kicking butt. 
you know, there, there was something just about Morpheus that just stood out to me. And that combined with a desire to write and tell these stories, um, I had started, I had started a story of my own called Route 3 as a prose, you know, novel and, you know, now it's a comic book. That all kind of time, you know, it was like a perfect mesh. It was a, it was like a weirdly perfect mesh. But the first Matrix was what kind of jump started it for me in addition to what I mentioned before, uh, Star Trek you know, reflecting, you know, seeing folks who look like me, seeing a, a more optimistic future, you know, but the thing that always has stood out about me about Star Wars, Star Trek is that we had to go through three world wars before we finally got to a point where we were like, okay, let's just kind of chill. <laughs> let's take a break. Um, <laughs> it's, you know, it's, a, it's like, you got to get smacked upside the head 500 times before you say, oh, like, let's go, let's go the other direction. And we finally did that, but there was something about the Matrix that it was just like this over-the-top sci-fi action, um, epic, you know, Joseph Campbell-esque story, you know, that was big for me, even bigger than something like Star Wars. And I know Star Wars is big for people, but when it came to Star Wars, I, I only saw like white British guys talking until, you know, Lando popped up. Um, that, for me, it was the Matrix um, as far as, and then, you know, learning more about indie black comics and, and then once again, milestone. So those are kind of a perfect mesh from I mean, for me. Right on. So Jalandra, what was the thing that got on your skin and ultimately made you uh, decide, especially from the academic direction that you're using, uh, that you were going to look at a future that perhaps was a little darker than people had anticipated? Um. So I think the way I found so. I think that the some of the experience I talked about with like not seeing a lot of blackness represented in these in speculative spaces. Um, definitely when I went to college and I was doing creative writing and went to graduate school and I was in programs like now there's this recognition of science fiction and fantasy as like you know, perfectly legitimate, right, um, writing to do. But I was, at the time when I was studying creative writing within the academic institution, it wasn't encouraged, you know? And I think particularly as a Black woman, there was definitely this sense, and I'm not sure where this came from. I think it came from a lot of different directions, but this sense that I wasn't supposed to do that, like this sense that I needed to write about like real things, <laughs> you know, or real, the current day. And so I think the way I found my way back to speculation was through Black women's fiction and actually seeing all of the ways within Black women's fiction where magic or what some people might call magic if you're not coming out of a sort of an African diasporic cultural framework, right? Um, mm -hmm. was running all throughout, like if you look at Toni Morrison's Beloved, it's a ghost story, right? We read it as a neo-slave narrative or historical fiction, but it is actually a ghost story, right? Um, you know, I think that's kind of how I found my way back because I started looking at all of the common threads running through the work of people like that, as well as more explicitly science fiction and fantasy writers like Octavia Butler, Tana Narif Du, um, Nalo Hawkinson, you know? So I think that that's kind of, I'm like, okay, there's ways to do this. And I don't know, for me, I just never was, even though there were individual things I liked, like Star Trek and The Matrix, I was never really super into a really far sort of high tech future. It was just kind of like never my thing. So one of the things I saw in these texts was ways in which kind of more near future um, and more speculation and technology and magic working into like our current day, like that these writers were giving me models for how that could look, right? Because I think one of the things I always had difficulty reconciling always being someone who was interested in history and started like learning the history of like black history from like a young age and someone who as an ethnic studies scholar was constantly sort of submerged and looking at like racialized violence and all these things I had trouble squaring mm -hmm. out how all of it could coexist like how you have magic in a world where you also have slavery <laughs> like enslavement you know so that's something that I struggled with that I think inhibited me a little bit creatively but those authors and that kind of work is what helped me like get back there, you know, like, like that there are models for how people are doing this, for how people are, are 
like allowing for the realities of us to have, for us to have magic and for us to have other worlds and other realms, even within, <laughs> you know, the, the constructs, you know, that like the things that are projected onto blackness, right? Or, or in the things that black people have to deal with for us to have that even within that. And, and I think it points the way to like how we survive the moments that we're in. Um, yeah, <laughs> I'll stop there. Absolutely, great. Uh, I'm going to move on to our next slide now. And uh, we've looked at a little bit about how we got to this point, but we are at a point now in, in uh, both literary history and in, in popular history where there are strides being made that, you know, Black representations are taking over the Nebula, Nebula Award, that we have, you know, two Black leads and two giant monster movies for Pacific Rim. We have Black Supermen and Green Lanterns and all types of new things that honestly, when I was growing up, were, would have seemed wholly implausible. Um, when we see this, what, are, what and I'll start with Dr. Davis, what are you seeing right now that's coming out that you say, wow, that really inspires me? Well, you know, I'm into mermaids right now. <laughs> you know, Let's so go mermaids, come on. Okay, because when I saw that the conversation was about comic books and superheroes, I'm like, I don't know that I'm the best person to talk about that because it's not, like, I love it. I'm here for Black Superman. I am. Like, especially someone who's raising a child, you know, who's raising, like, the fact that the first superhero I introduced my son to was Black Panther, you know, because he's like, he's young enough that that could be the first superhero he saw. I think it's amazing for me. As an audience, I'm here for it. As a critic and a scholar, I'm, I'm invested in different kinds of things. Um, so yeah, so I'm like, I'm into mermaids right now. There actually is a graphic novel. Um, I don't know if people are familiar with Drexia. The, um, so Drexia is a electronic, duo, um, Black electronic duo from the 1990s. And they created mm -hmm. this world building around themselves that they were the descendants of enslaved, were of pregnant African women who had been thrown from um, slavers ships. Um, and so one of the things that I'm looking at in my book project I'm working on is how other authors and creative have, have taken up this idea. And so um, Abdul, what is his name? Abdul Kadim Haq, who is, he mm. keeps a lot of the concept art for Drexia and their album covers and things like that. He's actually put out a, um, a graphic novel, The Book of Drexia. So I finally was able to get a hold of it. It's not really easy to get because they didn't print a lot of them. And they're supposed mm. to be volume two on the way. So I think that that's really exciting. Um, I've seen some of the authors who I love are starting to do, you know, comics and graphic novels. So right now I'm actually reading, um, I'm not done with this, so I can't say much, but I'm reading, um, I can't see my video, so I'm just talking into the PowerPoint, but I'm reading Nalo Hopkinson's House of Whispers. Um, mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I've seen that. And I definitely think she's doing things, like some of the things I'd like to see, because when I, one of the even though I, I enjoyed Book of Drexia, when I look at how the women were drawn, I'm just like, you know, <laughs> you know, just, you know, the tight waist, the big boobs, you know, like I'm, I'm kind of ready to see some, some, um, you know, more, you know, just different, different kinds of like representations of women, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. in particular, that kind of outside of the, the normative sort of comic way of drawing women. And so one thing I love about Ho House of Whispers is that, the um the female protagonist is full figured and she also takes the form of a mermaid she's actually urzuli so it's very much mm -hmm. um grounded in um african diasporic syncretic um religion so she's urzuli and um agwe is in here so it's the, the you know the buddha and loas um so i'm really inspired by things that i think really ground very specifically within African and African diaspora culture. And even though I love to see us taking those spaces, you know, like Black Superman and Black Green Lantern, why not? You know, like I, I'm, I'm here for it, but I also want to see us doing other kinds of things, <laughs> you know, like things that are very specifically grounded in like our religions and our folklores and our um, tastes in our histories, you know, like I, I'm like, I'm inspired by things that I think engage that. And so one of the things I'm seeing with so much of the, the work that I'm looking at around mermaids is that um, 
they are usually very intricately grounded in, you know, like Mami Wata, the Mami Wata pantheon and and um, there's the what I call the crossing merfolk narrative of the, you know, the idea that people who drowned during the Middle Passage actually became this other form of life. So that's the kind of stuff that I'm really critically and intellectually and emotionally excited by, even as I enjoy the more mainstream imagery as well. No, I'm very happy to talk about that, things like House of Secrets, because there is a very common misconception that comics have to be one thing or, one, or another, that they have to either have the cape or mask. And as you're showing with House of Secrets, with uh, things like that, and especially, and this is a great chance for me to segue, with something like Changa and the Jade Obelisk, that there's room for Black people and Black expression to happen throughout uh, sequential art in a lot of ways. So that's a good lead into uh, Robert, the writer of Changa and Jade Obelisk, uh, to talk to us about what have you seen uh, that's coming out right now that's really moving you emotionally? Everything Black indie comics. I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm just being real. Like, I, um, I, I feel that um, specifically that Black indie comics are, they have taken the lead for a while in telling our stories. One of the things that I love about you, you look at comic book markets in Japan and you look at comic book markets in Europe, uh, they don't tell just one story. It's not about just like tights and fights. And I think indie comic books in general, but specifically black indie comic books, we tell all sorts of stories. Um, if you want, you know, uh, if you want your superhero stories, but uh, within with an awesome perspective of the creative team, look at something like Black. If you want something that is tied more into mythology, but it's still telling a coming of age, you know, superhero story, uh, look at his Nana the Were Spider. Uh, if you are a mech Sorry. A fan, a fan of Voltron and you know shows like that from back in the day, you have Tuskegee. No, you're fine. You have Tuskegee Airs. Um, and then Ice Witch and Malice and Wonderland, uh, which are, you know, other stories, but it all it all runs the gamut, and that's as a writer. I mean, as a as a reader, that's what I prefer to read. I re I prefer to read a lot of different stuff, even though sci-fi seems to be my like wheelhouse. But um, with something like you know Changa, when Milton and one three and Jason with one thirty three art even approached me about that. I had never done fantasy before, um, albeit even African fantasy. So, I, as a as a fan of Milton's work, you know I I love reading it. Um, but to have a chance to kind of play in that once again in that wheelhouse, it I, I think it speaks to that that type of you know that type of diversity with the content is something which. I think is huge and which I think sets, you know, black indie comics a bar above a lot of what the mainstream is doing nowadays. Uh, even though I like there are, I think the, you know, the big two are making inroads. I mean, you have great examples down here, you know, with Joe Mullen, with uh, Far Sector, one of the greatest Green, Green Lantern stories ever told. And it, it, it's, for me, it's not, she needs to be right up there with Hal Jordan, but that's because you bring on N.K. Jemison and Jamal Campbell to tell that story. Mm -hmm. uh, there was one issue where one of the characters got called High Sididi. I, I lost it <laughs> when, that, when that happened um, because I know knowing Jemison's work from novels, from being a fan of hers, you combine her with telling this galactic, you know, epic space opera story, um, that's huge you know that that's huge so i think the indies are killing it uh on the storytelling front when it comes to comics um and I, but there there's just so much out there that i i think people just need to just you know try jumping in you know and and, and seeing what's out there that's wonderful and uh, also since we did get a chance to talk about changa a little bit that's a great segue over to milton the publisher who brought that uh, uh to life uh, what are you seeing in the marketplace that's coming out right now that makes you say wow or really excites you, Milton? Um, well, I'll, I'll tell you, the, um, the, the thing that excited me the most about anything over the past few months was actually, um, it wasn't really a science fiction. It was a, it was a fantasy movie. Um, it was a, um, Jingle Jangle. Oh, um, yes. <laughs> okay, yes. okay. Jingle Jangle blew me away. And I'll tell you why I did was because... Um, 
we talk about how we're doing, you know, of course the, the, the doors have opened as far as uh, black creative creators are concerned in speculative fiction. Um, but at the same time, it's still being kind of restrictive. A lot of the stories that we've seen that are really um, getting the attention are the ones that are telling stories that are associated to the struggle, you know, with us dealing with the issues that we deal with as black people. And the reason that Jingle Jangle blew me away was because you had this amazing musical that came out, which was very Afrocentric, you know, the way the people were dressed and everything combined with uh, what we call steampunk type aesthetic. It was very but, but it was about the people. It wasn't about the struggle. It was just about these characters and these people going through this situation. And, and I think that's a significant step forward as far as how we're, you know, showing black creativity. Um, I talked to a lot of people um, in the background and a lot of younger people that I've talked to lately that are getting into science fiction and fantasy. One of the things that comes up a lot, they say, well, I understand that these stories are important. It's important to us to talk about our history and our culture and what we've been through. And then they'll say, but I just want to really see a story one time with us just being heroes and us dealing mm -hmm. with different things like that. And I think that's the next step that we have to take as far as our mainstream creativity is concerned. Um, stories like Changa um, were things that, um, it was one of the first ideas I had before I started writing. And it was kind of like, you know, influenced by um, me being a fan of uh, Conan and different things like that. But wanting to present a story like that, that was within an Af Afrocentric context, and also making a character that wasn't like Ch wasn't like Conan. I wanted Chandler to be a different person, a different thing. And just kind of mm -hmm. getting on to what um, Robert was saying, I, I believe a lot of the change that we that we're seeing in the mainstream right now has basically come from the indie creative movement, because in indie you're not being restricted by the story that you tell. And I know for a fact by doing cons and different things like that, that these mainstream people, all the things that they believed in that wouldn't be, a, that wouldn't work and people wouldn't accept, they saw these indie creators going to these cons and seeing people really getting excited about this stuff. And they realized that, yeah, you can put black people on the front of a novel and people will still buy it. Right. And you can write a story that's based in African culture and people will still buy it and enjoy it. And I think that had a lot. And so everything that I've been seeing mainstream hasn't surprised me. It's been more of, um, okay, they're, they're finally getting it. And they're finally seeing that some of the things that they believe were basically misconceptions and that we can do this. And I think that's why we're seeing, you know, Black female Green Lantern. And we saw Black Panther done the way that it was done was because they knew that it wasn't, this wasn't a surprise. They knew just from seeing what was going on in the indie, in the indie um, industry that this was acceptable. So I think that we've made a lot of progress. I think that there's still a lot of progress to be made. And I still, and I think that a lot of that change is gonna still come from indie authors that aren't being restricted by editors and agents and gatekeepers um, to continue to like grow that narrative and, and show what's possible. Absolutely. I want to make a couple quick notes. First, one thing I really like about Changa uh, over Conan is that he's a thinker, that Conan kind of just blusters his way through things with brute force. And uh, while Changa does seem capable of that, it's not always his first call. And I really appreciate that. Also, to uh, make note as well, uh, one thing that I appreciate within uh, Jimson, what she did with uh, Joe Mullen and on the far sector of the Green Lantern that you see on the screen, is that the mythos was adapted. There'd always been this experimentation with the, the emotional spectrum and with willpower. And the difference that they made with Joe Mule's ring, a ring that wouldn't work for Hal Jordan, a ring that wouldn't work for Guy Gardner, because it was people who not only had the ability to overcome great fear, but who had great fear placed upon them at all times and still work through it. It's almost specifically a ring that only works for Black people. Uh, and when I saw it, I was like, oh my God, she's a, yeah. how did she get this in this book? What? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I need to talk to but, that editor. <laughs> yeah. I, I, well, the editor, it's funny you mention that. The editor's name is Andy Curry. They fired him. Oh, no. <laughs> they, <laughs> I worked with him back when we were both at Comic Book Resources. So I was okay. like, all right, Andy, respect. Yeah. respect. And then he lost his job. So. <laughs> but, you know, that's the way the gig works. Anyway, yeah. moving on. Um, we want to talk about 
continuing to deepen and expand on this, this work that we've done. So I'm going to again work backwards from the panel. Milton, you've uh, developed a wide swath of creative works with all the novels and all the projects you've done on your own and with collaborators to dream of Black presences in the past, in the future, and wherever else. Um, could, could you talk about, because like you said, you were, you're on the ground at a lot of these conventions back when we could physically go to conventions, uh, talking to people. Could you talk about first the work that you've done to help shift this tide and what things you think are left to do? What, what, what areas do you want to expand into that you have not covered yet? Well, for me, it's, um, um, that's what anthologies grew out of. Um, when, I, when I first met Charles Saunders um, and um, um, we were talking about Sword and Soul, and we talked about how um, we didn't have, we had to fight for the opportunity to tell the stories the way we wanted to tell them. And that's where the Griot's anthology came out of. We said, there are probably other authors out there that have been running into this same situation and haven't been able to tell their stories and stuff. So let's create an anthology that will give them the opportunity to tell these stories. And like we suspected, there were people who had sent stories that had been rejected. There were people who were afraid to send stories because they thought they would be rejected because they were Afrocentric. And we got these stories and that turned out to be one of my best anthologies and it's been, it's been a bestseller ever since then. So basically when, when I create an anthology, I'm really specifically looking for genres where I feel like we're not being represented properly <laughs> and then making an anthology to do that. You know, so I mean, Griosis of the Spear, we, we, at that point we'd seen very few black women as sword and sorcery main characters and that's what that book was about. Um, steampunk came out of a whole conversation about the lack of black representation in the steampunk genre. Diesel punk, mm -hmm. diesel punk the same way. Um, Dark Universe series came out from the fact that as black people, we imagine ourselves in the future, but I'd never really seen a book where I saw what we were imagining ourselves controlling the future. So that's mm -hmm. what Dark Universe was about, an Afrocentric galactic empire um, and imagining that, okay, if it's Afrocentric, then that means uh, everybody will be walking around with Afrocentric patterns, kind of like us. we saw in Jingle Jangle and stuff like that, because this is the main culture controlling that. And um, even with with uh, with uh, Cyberpunk, the new one that we got coming out now, was the same thing. Looking at these genres and saying, okay, let's give Black people the opportunity uh, to play in these genres the way that they want to play in. And what you get is you get, the way I describe it is that you get some stories where the main characters happen to be black and you get some stories where the main characters have to be black. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's what that whole, um, that, and that's what our whole thing that, that we do. And, and I wanna, you know, we're gonna continue to do that. Um, one that we're working on right now is the spy funk anthology, mm -hmm. which is not necessarily speculative fiction, but it's the same thing. I'm not excited about, and I know we'll fight about this forever. I'm not excited about a black James Bond. What I'm excited about is a series of black stories, a stories about a black spy person that is black from the beginning. Mm -hmm. You know, kind of like um, um, what was the one Queen so was it Queen Sono out of uh, South Africa? You know, yes, sir. You know, when I saw that, I was like, yeah. okay, that's what I want to see. I want to see yeah. something that's built around that narrative and stuff. So um, I'm always looking for um, opportunities and situations to where um, I feel like we're not being properly represented and giving authors the opportunity to do that. Because once, my job is the easiest job in the world as an editor. Um, because once you create the opportunity, um, the quality shows up, you know, mm. right? because they've been there waiting to do something like that. And we always get great stories because of that. So that's, that's where I am as far as um, um, moving forward into the future. All right. I'm gonna skip around a little here. Delandra, I definitely wanna uh, ask from an uh, academic side, you just this week did this uh, English colloquia on black Atlantic merfolk, which was very, very impressive. Uh, could you expand on how these kind of watery images offer a possible glimpse at, at alternate, alternate ways of, of being that black people may not see on a regular basis or that, that we may need to move into? Definitely. Um, so it's so interesting because alongside doing this project, I've been, um, it sounds kooky to say it, but I feel like I'm becoming a mermaid. Um, you know, like, I, cause I'm like, how am I gonna be Moisturize. all- Moisturize, moisturize. Yes, well, I'm, how am I gonna be all invested in mermaids and I can't swim, right? So I've been like taking <laughs> swimming lessons and <laughs> I bought a tail. Like, it's like one of those tails you can swim. Um, but it's really strange because I feel like reading these texts, 
I almost feel like I'm starting to see the world from the point of view of a creature that lives in the water. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. when you look at the world from that point of view, you realize that humans are absolute trash. <laughs> just, I, I mean, you're not wrong. <laughs> it's just, what 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 humans are doing to the earth and it's not all, yeah. all humans are not equally cu culpable for this it is the white supremacist patriarchal capitalist modern project that is only <laughs> less than a thousand years old you know so what i'm really interested in is like black models of not only futurity but just of other kinds of ways of being that's that recover some of our kind of ancestral relationships to the earth and the water as it was disrupted by white supremacy, you know? So um, I'm really I'm really interested in seeing, I guess that's why I'm invested in the near future because I'm not convinced that we have a far one. Um, <laughs> like that humanity, I mean... <laughs> you know, like, I mean, that humanity has a far future. Like I'm really interested in the ways that black people have like we have these histories and not only history, but things that people are doing right now that are modeling these other ways of living and these other ways of being, right? So I was actually listening to this podcast. Um, there's this podcast called How to Survive the End of the Earth um, by Adrian and Marie Brown and her sister, Amber Brown. And they had a woman on, I, I wrote it down because I wanted to talk about it today, but they had a woman on, um, um, uh, what's her name? Leah Penniman. And she's the founder of something called the Soul Fire Farm. And it's um, mm -hmm. like a food justice farming collective. And one of the things that they, that they, that they have done is um, remediation to the soil. Because everyone wants to do, oh, I want a garden. I want a garden. But the problem is our soil, we have lead and contaminants. And so mm -hmm. she tells this story on the podcast about how before women were transported on the slave ships that they sold the not sold, but they braided the seeds of a um, paragonium, a pelargonium mm -hmm. flower into their hair. And that actually um, this flower can actually remove contaminants and metals from the soil, right? So mm -hmm. like, I, I find myself really interested and invested in like speculations and visions of the future that build on these kinds of um like the things that black people, like black people started the farm to table movement, black people, black and indigenous people, as well as other groups of color, like started, like have always done sustainable farming, like cooperative economics. And now when we talk about cooperative economics, people just interpret it as a black capitalism, support black business, which is a good thing to do. But black people actually created models of like collective ownership and all of just these more sustainable ways of living that that act in opposition to capitalism in opposition to white supremacy and the concept of private ownership even the concepts of like monarchy and these hierarchies that are sort of implied when you look at those kinds of worlds you know so i'm really that's what i'm excited about and as i start to get back into my creative work alongside the critical work this these are the kinds of worlds i'm interested in building on the worlds that we actually already have created and already are creating that are giving us alternatives to this world that is is utterly destroying itself um so <laughs> yeah. it's interesting it's something you said about what both the seed and the idea of, of these these mer people living in environments that are lethal or being able to alter environments that are lethal to most people, but they have found a way not only to survive and thrive. I think that's a fascinating model for all, us all to, to take a look at, definitely. Yeah, and what excites me about the cross, what I call the crossing merfolk er narrative is the idea of mer people who were born during the transatlantic crossing. It's like, cause I choose mm -hmm. to believe they're there, you know? <laughs> you know, so I mean, 85% of the ocean, 90% is unexplored, is that it coexists what we live through now like it's already there we've already made it like we have already become what we need to be we've already created all we have to figure out is just how to like make it bigger and get more people there but we've already mm -hmm. done it, you know and i guess that's how kind of the merfolk narrative for me connects to looking at histories around you know 
Black people's connection to the earth and sustainable farming and, and all of those kinds of things. It's like, we've, we've already done it. <laughs> you know, we've already it. created the world that we need. So it's just a matter of, okay, how do we like draw more attention to that and get more people to do it and find ways to make it bigger, but we actually have already done it. Well, you're definitely making steps in that direction. So I, I appreciate that. I'm going to take a look at Robert now. Robert, you talked about starting out with Route 3, or mm -hmm. uh, is it Route or Route? I can never get that right. Um, and Whatever Sean sells Anderson. the book. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, you and Sean have been riding that route for a long time. Yeah. Today, um, <laughs> as well as other visions of the future that you've done in your work. Could you talk about some of the themes discussed in the work that you do, some common mm -hmm. things you see coming up, and what sorts of things you think might be left for you personally to cover you, the things that you haven't gotten to yet. Yeah, so for you know round three, uh, strangely enough, it was a story that I, I wanted to tell that dealt with loss. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when you have the weight of the world on your shoulders, and uh, especially as a young black teen in this country, <clears throat> and, and and it's one of those, and it's I wanted people and I need people to realize that seeing a complex character of color is not an anomaly and that that's key that would that was huge for me going into creating the series um you know the the more mental health aspect of things dealing with loss and depression you know as i got older that definitely kind of sifted you know that that crept more uh into the story um but it's all of this and then some you know, thrown onto the, the shoulders of like a 16 year old from Stone Mountain, Georgia. Um, and I didn't, see, I don't see that. I don't see <laughs> those complex characters and the stuff that are at least many people who look like me able to, you know, show that we can, we can be just as complex as everybody else or just deal with the same stuff with all of this fantastical stuff happening around us. Um, I feel as black folks, we, we exist in many different facets. There's so just as much as you might see a certain set of hobbits change over the course of an epic journey, uh, that's what's happening with Sean. You know, I, one of my, one of the things that I love most about like the Hobbit is that Bilbo is uh, complaining the whole, whole way through. Like his life is basically <laughs> been turned upside down. He wants to go back to the comfort of his house, but he just complains and and it's just, and, and that's, and for some people that's seen as a flaw, for other people I see that as just being real. Um, so, you know, and that, that tied into the fellowship and, you know, just all the, you know, when I go to the, you know, go to the sci-fi or fantasy book section of, I was about to say B. Dalton or Walden books, oh my God, um, Barnes and Noble, <laughs> you know, when I go to you Barnes and Noble. You have a time Noble, machine? <laughs> yeah, oh my God, yeah, yeah, like North DeKalb Mall, B. Dalton or Walden Books. I think it was Walden Books. Uh, but I would always run to those sec sections and I would see the covers of just white folks. <laughs> you know, just say like, and these books were thick. I love reading thick books. And, and it really frustrated me that when I started reading Octavia Butler, that she needed, I felt her work needed to be in two sections, the African-American studies section and the sci-fi section. Uh, it was very, so that's the, just as much as you see the complexity with, you know, the trials and tribulations that these heroes and heroines go through in these, you know, larger than life stories, that's what I want with Route 3. That's what I want with Sean Anderson. Um, and, you know, and I feel that we're, you know, in the future issues or for the story arc, we, we are definitely going to get there. I mean, the opening scene for issue four opens up with him by his mom's deathbed. Um, and I can't get any more realer than that than having a father who has passed away from cancer. So that has informed the story that I'm telling with Sean Anderson. It's not about just the Dragon Ball Z fights. It's not about whether Sean Anderson can kick Superman's butt. <laughs> There's, there has to be something more deeper there. And I think that that separates a great story from lesser. Wow. Okay, uh, I, we are, uh, if I'm looking at the time right, we've got about three or four minutes left. So I wanna open up for questions, because believe me, I had, as you saw in my outline, I emailed you all, I have much more that we could cover. But real quickly, let's just cycle back one more time and say how the audience can find you. Jalandra, please uh, go first and uh, talk about how they can find the illustrious Dr. Davis online. 
So um, I'm on Twitter at Jalandra Davis and my website is jalandradavis.com and you spell Jalandra, J-A-L-O-N as in Nancy, D as in dog, R-A. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's it. We have to learn how to spell it out that way, I know. Uh, mm -hmm. Robert, please uh, go up next and tell people how to find you online before we open up for questions. Yeah, uh, website is Robert K J E F F R E Y dot com. That's Robert K J E F F R E Y dot com. Instagram, I'm Robert K dot Jeffrey, and on Facebook, I am actually just keep it at Instagram, Robert K dot Jeffrey. <laughs> that that's it. <laughs> so got to consolidate, brother. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Milton, please tell us where people can find your work online before we open for questions. Okay, um, you can find me at my um, my books at www.mvmediaatl.com. You can find me on Facebook as, as Milton Davis. You can find me on Twitter as at the Grio, and that's Grio with the T, not Grio without the T. That's NBC. <laughs> you can also find me on uh, Instagram at at obadoro.com. That's O B A D O R O. I mean without the calm but i need to get like the rest of you guys and streamline my stuff and just have my same name everywhere <laughs> it, it saves you a lot of typing so much typing. <laughs> all right it. i'm going to look now and see i believe if i understand how this works people can raise their hands if they want uh to ask a question i'm trying to remember how we do because we don't use zoom at my job so i don't use it all the time um and if there are questions, otherwise I can dive into one of my last ones before we go here. So of our people in the audience, sorry, I'm trying to look through this. Do we have any questions anybody would want to ask before I go ahead? All right. Let's see. Because oh, I think hand raising is a thing in Zoom. I think I'm remembering that right. Mm -hmm. But OK, good. Because you, you have to tell me, doctor. I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing all the time. <laughs> um, <laughs> don't right, well, since, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I don't always know what I'm doing now. Uh, since I don't see any, I'm just going to uh, go and see uh, for all of you. I'll just toss this one last question out for all of you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm actually going to change it up from the one I emailed you because I'm feeling kooky. Um, what's the one thing that today you don't believe you could ever see if you went out to it, we can't get in the time machine, go to a Walden books, but whatever a bookstore looks like in this day, what's the one thing that you don't believe you could ever see that you absolutely believe we should see in, uh, in popular fiction and speculative fiction, science fiction, comics, and so on and so forth. And again, I'll go to the good doctor first. What, I'm a little, what do I, what do I think? What, what, what should we see that there's no possible chance that we could see? Oh, God. Oh, start with something mean, else. <laughs> I can. Well, can I, I you know you know what I'm kind of interested in, but I I'm I I'd like to see. I mean, you know, I'm really into different kinds of images of heroism. You know, um, mm -hmm. you know, like even though I like the you know I like a good fight, I like all of that, but I'm really interested in different kinds of heroism, and I'm also really interested in like seeing different kinds of representations around like gender and sexuality. You know, so maybe like a black trans like hero that fights in some different kind of way, you know, that is not actually like, you know, <laughs> you know, I mean, I feel like that would be difficult. Um, I feel like that would be difficult for a lot of reasons, but I still hope to see it, you know. Well, it's funny you mentioned that because. Uh, both in Milton's cyberpunk story uh, uh, anthology and in the upcoming Noir the New Black, which is the next panel, I actually wrote a story about a black trans uh, <laughs> I think uh, protagonist. I see it in indie, like I'm sure that because you know all you have to do is create it. But when I think about mm. will we see that like on a big screen or something, you know? But no, mm. I'm really That's happy that you wrote something that you know that that is happening. You know. I just felt like I had your order ready to go. <laughs> uh, Robert, Robert, your turn. What is something that you don't believe we could possibly see, but we absolutely need to see? I want billions, millions to billions of dollars put behind from whatever producing source, um, legitimate producing source, 
um, from in, from the indie front to the Hollywood front. I want all those billions of dollars put behind adapting something like Dark Universe. Um, I need to see a completely, I, I wrote a story for Dark Universe, which was just a group of Black women. They were sisters <laughs> and they were kicking butt and saving the day. Like I want that amount of money to be put behind something like that and not have somebody so, well, there are so many risks involved with doing that. No, just do it. Like if you can do that with the worst Steven Seagal movies from back in the day, you can do that with us. Um, I just, I like, I, we, um, Tyler Perry, open up your pocketbooks for something outside of comedies. I'm being real. <laughs> it's just like, because we are here and we will accept it. And we are, we are hungry for it. Um, that's what I want. I, I like it, but I don't think he'll pay the writers. Uh, moving on to Milton. <laughs> uh, what do you think we absolutely should see, but we prop there's very little chance that we could see? Well, there's so many things, but I'm gonna leave it to one simple thing. I wanna walk into a Barnes and Noble, go to the science fiction section and see more than one black author on the shelf. <laughs> <laughs> that's all because my wife she loves to go to Barnes and Nobles either it's going to be well N.K. Jemison is almost a given now you're going to see her books on the shelf mm -hmm. um, sometimes you're going to see Nydia Corfor mm -hmm. sometimes you might see Tana Nareel do but I want to be able to go in there and just see you know a, a, a variety of black authors in the science fiction and fantasy section that's, that's all I ask simple as that <laughs> I love it that's fantastic Okay, I, I'm looking at my, we do you're have, about to say something, Jelanda? I have some, I don't know if we have time. And I mean, this, I, Come think, on. This, I think it's possible, but it's become something that I've been noticing in on the critical side, in the critical world, is that when you see conversations about Afrofuturism, it's similar, I think, to the whole, the bookstore and us only being in one section. I want to see the Black the the ways that black authors are working with certain kinds of themes and tropes that you also see in mainstream science fiction be centered in conversations about them right so like you know black steampunk being centered like black authors not always being pushed into like okay they're talking about afrofuturism over here and over here we're talking about this 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 thing that has nothing to do with that you know what i mean yeah, yeah. i understand it's All right, cool, I'll cool. take the Walmart. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm starting to see some of the panelists for the next one uh, trickle in. So uh, I'm going to uh, thank you all for uh, doing this panel with me. Uh, this has been Black Side of the Moon 2 with Dr. Jelandra Davis, Robert K. Jeffrey, and Milton Davis. They talked about how to find them online. Please go and purchase their works and please go uh, support them in the efforts that they do as they are working to make a more interesting future for us all. My name is Hannibal Taboo. I've been moderating this panel. Hang tight. We're going to be starting up the Noir is the New Black panel, I think, in about three or four minutes. Uh, I'm